We have also, in these recent decades, established two new institutions of higher learning here. The Institute of Ismaili Studies and the Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations, which is part of the Arkhan University. They both offer master's level teaching programs, they engage in research and publication, and they also develop curriculum materials for children in primary and secondary schools. In all these efforts, they take a holistic, civilizational approach to Islamic studies, rather than emphasizing the more narrow domain of theological dialectic. What some describe as a clash of civilizations in our modern world is, in my view, a clash of ignorances. This is why education about religion and cultural heritage is so critically important. And while we will continue to invest in these institutions, we deeply believe that scholarship, publication and instruction of high quality and generous breadth can provide important pathways toward a more pluralistic and peaceful world. All of these comments then speak to the context in which we gather tonight, a rich history of partnership, reaching deeply into the past and extending, we hope and trust, into an even more productive future. Thank you. Yali Madad, welcome. Bienvenue, Husham Madid. A very warm welcome to tonight's Friday Night Reflections to our Jamaat and multi-faith family members. My name is Asif Ali Penwala in Vancouver, and I am honored to be hosting the program today. With a name like Penwala, you can imagine what I do for a living. If you guess teacher, you're correct. And I guess, hey, our parents know best, right? It's a busy time nowadays with students going back to school with online virtual learning. As a graduate of the Secondary Teacher Education Program, or STEP, I am so excited to be doing, again, what I love, teaching. Although I do really miss being able to see my students and their families in person. At this time, all teachers across the country, all Beethoven teachers, are doing their best to create relationships of care one-to-one -one with their students and the family members, so that on that basis, we can design and create meaningful, relevant, and engaging learning experiences. Tonight, we continue with Friday Night Reflections, the Jamaat's touch point for the week. The theme for the show is Lighting the Spark, a conversation with teachers who shape the minds of today and tomorrow. We commemorate World Teachers Day on this episode and hear from graduates of the STEP program about their experience in London and while teaching. I hope you enjoyed our opening segment on Molana Hajram's Golden Jubilee visit to the UK. So now let's take a look at the program we have for you today. I'm excited to welcome back Council President for Canada, Amir Ali Kasim Laka, who will provide us an update on recent developments and our response to the pandemic. We will then have the privilege of having a conversation with Dr. Nadia Ibu Jamal, a historian with the Institute of Ismaili Studies and a very dear professor of mine. Uh, we will then continue with a conversation with some of my colleagues and graduates from the STEP program, where we'll discuss Molana Hazri Mom's vision for a high quality, holistic education for our secondary students. We'll take a pause for some fun with a Kahoot quiz, where we'll test your knowledge of the secondary curriculum. And of course, you know, no program would be complete without some inspiring and musical expressions. So sit back, relax, and join me. And now I'm pleased to welcome President Amirli Kasim Laka. My dear brothers and sisters, Yale Wadad. It's a pleasure to address you again tonight on Friday Night Reflections. I want to start by thanking the Jamaat for your patience and support over the past few months. Throughout the process of reopening Jamaat Khanas in Canada, the Jamaat has been exceptionally understanding and accommodating towards the new measures which have become necessary for safe operation of our facilities. This has allowed us to open our Jamaat Khanas across the 
country while adhering to public health guidelines. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to pose challenges for all of us. Economic issues, social isolation, physical and mental health concerns. Through all of this, the Jamaat's resilience, willingness to support one another, maintain safety, combat loneliness, and contribute time and resources to strengthen the community have been remarkable. This is due in large part to the tireless and rigorous work of all our volunteers. Your service in this difficult time has been exceptional. Thank you to each one of you for your continued support. Members of the Jamaat, in previous addresses, I had mentioned that we would keep you updated regarding our Jamaat Khanna facilities so that the Jamaat is always fully aware of our thinking surrounding the environment we are in. The events of this past week have been concerning. Ontario and Quebec are seeing a purported second wave of cases of COVID-19. In some regions, we are seeing even higher daily rates of new infections than we saw during the first wave. Both provinces have recently introduced new public health measures to attempt to limit the spread. Similar trends in COVID-19 rates are occurring in British Columbia, Alberta and Manitoba. And this is occurring across all age groups, young and old. We are entering the cold season, a time when extra vigilance is required. The Jamaat institutions have been closely monitoring these developments and as a result are further reducing Jamaat Khanna capacity in Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario and Quebec. You will have noticed this in the past few days or will notice this in the coming days. Once the community infection rates trend down and stabilize at an acceptable level, we will inshallah increase Jamaat Khanna capacity again through our registration system. The increasing rates of COVID-19 may necessitate further government regulations and stricter lockdowns, and we must be prepared for this if this happens. This may even mean temporary closure of some of the Jamaat Khanas if the risk is high. So, today, I would like to stress upon every member of the Canadian Jamaat, please do not let your guard down. I know this is a difficult time, but your health and well-being are too important to risk. Please exercise great caution whenever you leave your household. Do not attend social gatherings or invite others. If you're not well, seek medical assistance and otherwise stay home until you are feeling better. Many students have returned to school and some of us are back at our jobs, offices and businesses. Be very cautious in your interactions outside of your homes. Do everything you can to protect yourselves and your loved ones. Remember Molana Hazramam's guidance provided at the start of the pandemic to vigilantly maintain safety and hygiene until there is a vaccine solution. This is still going to take time. I also request your utmost consideration and sensitivity when attending Jamaat Khanna. Jamaat Khanna reopening has served as a source of great joy for all of us. But please take every precaution when attending, such that our broader Jamaat may continue to benefit. Full compliance with the protocol of masks on at all times, two meter distancing and hand sanitization is needed to ensure Jamaat safety. The whole system is based on the three protocols being implemented in tandem. Any break in the protocol creates a weak link and exposes others in the Jamaat. 
So let us be mindful of our obligation towards one another. This includes not holding an assigned spot which others could use at a time when capacity is very limited. Members of Jamaat, we are living through an unusually difficult period in our lives. We know this is not easy, given the duration since the start of the COVID pandemic and until the vaccine is found. For those who feel lonely or anxious or worried about their economic situation and the options to consider, please do not hesitate to reach out through the access line and ask for information or support. Remember that we are here to assist in whatever way we can. We ask you to show the same care for those in need within our Jamaat. This is what a family does for one another in times of need. Use this time to think about the future, about the opportunities which lie ahead. Remember what we shared with you a few weeks ago about the Future of Work initiative in Canada, which Molana Hazimam has graciously approved. Do everything in your means to plan a better future for yourselves, your families, your employment prospects and business prospects. The majority of post-secondary programs offered by colleges, institutes and universities are now available online and can be accessed from the convenience of your homes. This is the time to reflect, research, prepare, pivot and take advantage. This is the silver lining in this pandemic. Think things through and move ahead of the curve to build an intelligent foundation for the future. In conclusion, I want to say to you, and I hope you will listen carefully, that Molana Hazriman has expressed concern with respect to members of the Canadian Jamaat who risk losing their employment and incomes that they should seek long-term solutions to the employment challenges ahead. I cannot be more explicit in sharing this with you. Our beloved Imam wants the Canadian Jamaat to think of long-term employment solutions. Thank you to all of you and stay safe. Kudafiz. Thank you, President Saib. Thank you for giving us your time and for reminding us to remain vigilant so that we can keep our Jamaat and our family safe. Well, we now move to Lisbon, where we caught up with Dr. Nadia Ibu Jamal for her insights into the STEP program. Dr. Ibu Jamal completed her PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Literature from New York University in 1996 and is a specialist in Persian history and culture in the period of Mongol rule, with a particular emphasis on the Ismaili communities of the time. Over the past 15 years, she has been actively involved in, the, in varying ways with the Ismaili Tariqa religious education boards in the United Kingdom and the United States, providing her expertise and assistance to teaching activities, developing educational materials and human resources, and contributing to the Ismaili community's various educational programs. She currently serves as a member of the faculty of the Institute of Ismaili Studies, and I am pleased to have her join us. Dr. Jamal, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Ibu Jamal, for joining us today. I want to ask you, can you tell us um, what, gave, what was the vision of Mulan Hazri Mam that gave rise to the STEP program and curriculum? And how was the STEP curriculum developed and how did Molana Hazram guide it through its creation? Well, thank you very much, Asif and Yali Madad, to everybody. Um, I mean, as everybody knows, the religious education of the Jamaat is a key component of our beloved Molana Hazram's work throughout his imamat. In fact, all our imams of the time throughout their history have been concerned with that education. But over the last decades, Molana Hazrimam has been increasingly concerned about the misperceptions, the misinformation, 
the stereotypes about Islam and Muslims, particularly in the West, and theories of the clash of civilizations. And he's been very keen to address what he terms as a clash of ignorances. Um, and as a result of that, Imam gave particular guidance to the Institute of Ismaili Studies to develop uh, educational materials, a curriculum that would showcase Islam, not just as a faith, but as a multiplicity of civilizations. So to fulfill Imam's vision, these materials aim to provide and display a, a vast scope of Muslim civilizations, uh, the diversity of the Muslim peoples, the diversity of their engagement with the divine, ethical principles on which they're rooted, um, diverse notions of authority or diverse interpretations, differences in languages, in ethnicities, in cultures, in customs, practices, traditions. And additionally, the curriculum aims to show Muslim encounters with other communities. But the overarching goal of most concern to the Imam is to present this vast mosaic of 1.6 billion Muslims within which we can place the Ismaili Imamate and Ismaili, diverse Ismaili communities. But in addition to all of that, most significantly, Molana Hazrimam wanted a curriculum that would go beyond just providing information, but would generate in the students love and devotion to the Imam of the time, a commitment to faith. Uh, it would help inspire and inculcate values, ethics, um, develop notions of spirituality, uh, a sense of belonging to the wider Ummah, and most significantly, pride in the heritage and an ability for students to cement their identity as Shia Imami Ismaili Muslims. And to that end, Mulana Hazimam has personally spent many, many hours providing insight and guidance as to the content and the approach of the secondary curriculum. It's very dear to his heart and he spends uh, a great deal of time uh, researching and looking at the materials. Thank you, Dr. Jamal. Um, it's just wonderful to hear and in really inspiring, you know, the, the time and intention that was put behind the curriculum and the program. Uh, you know, in my experience, the curriculum generates, you know, curiosity from our students and really is fascinating. Inshallah, when I have children, um, I'm happy to know that they will have this kind of education. I want to ask you, in what ways do you see the curriculum playing a role beyond the secondary classroom? Um... The Imam's vision has always been that the curriculum would have a broader mandate, that it was not just aimed or targeted for students per se, but that it would broaden the horizons of knowledge for a much larger, larger audience. He was very keen that the Jamaat would engage uh, in the curriculum uh, that other Muslims would also find the material important and engaging and inspiring, as well as other communities, members of other communities, um, that would also find this civilizational approach, not a theological approach, uh, would find that very beneficial. Uh, in so, in, in, in effect, the Institute has already had requests from various governments and educational communities uh, to review and use adaptations of the secondary curriculum in their school systems. Thank you, Dr. Jalal. 
Lastly, I wanted to ask you, what led to the development of the STEP Teachers Program? The STEP Teacher Education Program is a special program. It is a dual uh, postgraduate program that uh, combines a master's in the study of Muslim civilizations with uh, either a master's or a teaching diploma. And the program was also devised uh, according to the guidance of our Imam um, to develop highly trained teachers, teachers who would be trained both in the pedagogy and content skills. Uh, it's a huge uh, task um, to actually uh, cov cover the materials, but it is it takes a very dedicated, uh, true commitment from teachers to be able to breathe life into the curriculum, to be exemplars, to be leaders, to uh, assist and help in the religious formation of Ismaili students globally, um, to develop leaders, future leaders of the Jamaat certainly not an easy task, but takes a, a great deal of inspiration and commitment. Um, Molana Hazimam said, I look forward to a time when our secondary curriculum will be completed and will be taught profession by professionally trained teachers. Uh, he felt it was very essential that a curriculum of this type would need to have professionally trained teachers. And he said that in the years ahead, he hoped that we would be able to count on well-educated, highly trained men and women who would be able to take us where the tariqa is and where the ummah should be. Um, he was very keen to see the details of the program, how they would be able to connect uh, the learnings of the master's program, how to actually handle the curriculum itself and to be able to provide, um, you know, a, a, a basis for the religious formation of uh, the Jamaat in general. Thank you, Dr. Ibu Jamal. You know, I can remember till this day when I heard Malana Hazramam's uh, vision for the STEP program, and I think it's going to remain with me um, forever. Uh, thanks for help, uh, for being with us here today and for helping you relive my days at the IIS. You know, your classes um, that we had with you um, will remain a highlight of my educational career because you always took us on a journey that was both inspiring and intellectually rigorous. And that's something I try to do for my students. So thank you for that modeling and for uh, your care for us and for the Jamaat. Thank you. And I, and I would like to pay tribute to the wonderful, wonderful uh, men and women of the STEP program, the teachers as a faculty and a curriculum writer. It has been a real inspiration for me to work with such dedicated individuals. So thank you and Yali Madhu to everybody and the Jamaat. Thank you. Well, speaking of the STEP program and its graduates, let's go talk to some of them. We have here today three of my friends and colleagues who are in Toronto. Mejgan Hakimi, Fatima Kaba and Fayaz Ali. Welcome and let's get started. So thank you, Fayaz, Mejgan, and Fatima for joining us for this panel discussion. Uh, I wanted to start by asking you if you can tell us, you know, why did you join the STEP program? Uh, a, little, a little bit about you and also maybe about your experience while you were in London. Um, as a child living in Afghanistan, I often struggled between my Shia Ismaili identity and pretending to be Sunni uh, when I was with my friends and in, in school. Um, when I came to Canada, I was finally so happy that I didn't have to worry about that and I was recognized as a person um, and I won't be singled out because the way I looked or the way I practiced my faith. Uh, but soon enough, 9-11 happened and all over again, I had to explain who I was as Shia Ismaili Muslim. 
um, coming from Afghanistan. So the STEP program really helped me understand my fate, be able to articulate who I was, and be confident about my identity as an Ismaili. Um, and also, uh, I was really happy that I was uh, helping other young people uh, here in my, um, in my BY classrooms um, in how they can articulate their faith or identity as Shia Ismaili Muslims. Being in London and doing the STEP program, uh, I was so fortunate to be able to learn from my colleagues from around the world um, and also um, take advantage of the vibrant culture in, in London. Thank you, Mejgan. Um, Fayez, can you share your experience? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so in my 20s, um, I was having a bit of a problem with what was happening in the world. And I would commute from my suburban home to downtown Toronto every single day. And on the way, I would witness um, human beings without shelter sleeping underneath towers that generate wealth every single second. And so that contradiction really bothered me. And looking at that uh, in relation to Hazar Imam's work on human development, uh, really made me understand the, the role of education in, in human development. And so when STEP rolled around, um, it was a natural progression for me and I applied. And in London, um, I got to learn more about what it means to actually um, do work in education that relates to the development of the mind and the development of the, the soul. And so that was a really fruitful experience for me. Thank you, Fayez. Um, Fatima, how about you? Yeah, so, you know, this program came around um, when I had been teaching already now in the secular system for three years. Uh, and education to me has always been something that's been important to me. I have known that I've wanted to be a teacher since I was really young. And so education is a natural uh, fit. But then when STEP rolled around, it not only had this component of education, but it also allowed an exploration of faith. And around that time, I really was so interested in learning about history, asking lots of questions, and I was on my own journey. And this sort of just married the two ideas of my secular education, my thirst for knowledge, and it just worked so naturally that I had to apply. And, you know, lo and behold, I made it to London where, you know, a group of us all came together and the learning that took place where we could feed off of each other's curiosity, we engaged in conversations that, you know, you would never imagine having, asking existential questions, wondering about the world, and also how do we fit into it? And then translating it to our students and to the future of our Jamaat. How do we take that information and then impart it on young minds? So for me, it was so fascinating and so interesting that this could all come together wrapped in a nice little package. Thank you, Fatima. Uh, from all your responses, I mean, there's such passion, such joy, such, you know, personal uh, experience that you bring to this work. And I can really see that it's more than just work for, for all of you, as it is for myself as well. Um, you know, day in and day out, you work with, you know, weekly with students, with Ismaili students from um, in your regions and, you know, for us across the country. I, I wanted to know, is there a particular story that stands out to you or something that seems to be really important to you in your practice? Um, Fayaz, would you like to share with us? Yeah, so this one story really stands out in my earlier years of teaching. So I had the student uh, and she was really passionate about the environment. But unfortunately, she did not see that reflected in the Jamaati community she, she was part of. And so I remember one day um, in class, we were discussing uh, a question from our IIS secondary curriculum. And the question was, are we guardians of the earth or are we merely consumers of the earth? And so that discussion um, was about teaching the concept of Khalifa, uh, i.e. custodians of the earth, and I was teaching the students that, look, this is part and parcel of the Muslim tradition. 
that we are meant to be custodians of the earth. And so after that class, this student came up to me and she said, Mr. Ali, before this class, I was debating if I should be an Ismaili or if I should be an environmentalist. But now I feel like I can proudly say that I am an Ismaili Muslim environmentalist. So what happened there is that, you know, Hazrat Imam uses the imagery of a bridge, not surprisingly because he loves architecture so much. And the bridge between um, faith and world, that imagery for me became true that, that moment uh, because that student was able to connect um, their passion for uh, ethics in the world and, you know, a new understanding of their Muslim tradition, Ismaili Muslim tradition. And so I feel like as teachers, we're actively constructing these bridges um, every single time we embark on creating a learning experience for a child. And another story that stands out to me is a child was being persuaded that, you know, faith and tradition are outdated in our world today. We don't need faith and tradition. And so that sparked that, that, that student to reach out to me. And she said, you know, I'm, I'm having this uh, difficult time understanding why faith matters today. And so that resulted in me doing some more research around the place of faith perspectives in our modern secular societies. And so we became, you know, like we were following Socrates' mantra, which is, you know, an unexamined life is not worth living. And so we began to examine, you know, what is the place of faith in our secular society? And that led to many discussions between myself and the student, both inside the class and outside the class. And so I think after that, there was an understanding in the student that, look, faith and tradition can be looked at from multiple ways. And so again, a bridge was created here. Uh, and so I think these two stories really speak to how we're trying to uh, fulfill the vision of the Imam. Um, as we know in our work, uh, it takes us beyond the scope of the local classroom. Uh, myself, I've had the blessing and opportunity to work with a number of Jamaats around the world. Uh, you know, I remember in particular working with the Jamaat in Madagascar and the opportunity to help them set up the STEP program. Uh, I know in Montreal, when I was there, we had an opportunity to be guest speakers at uh, McGill University to talk to future um, teachers. And so what I wanted to ask you, uh, all three of you, is can you share with us in the work that you're doing, uh, what opportunities have you had to go beyond the scope of, let's say, the local classroom? Yeah, you know, we live in Toronto or I live in Toronto here. And uh, one of the benefits of being here is having beautiful buildings to visit and to work out of. And the museum has been one of those places where the teachers can go to learn, to engage with new exhibits, but it goes beyond that. This building has built an opportunity for us to bring to our students a sense of pride and confidence in who they are through architecture, through education, through outreach. And so what we try to do with building a relationship with the museum is thinking about ways of engaging our youth in a way that they feel as though this space is their space and that they can find a sense of belonging there and then they can translate that into the community. They can talk to their peers, talk to their teachers and invite people into our community, share their learning and really engage with this idea that Hazri Imam is trying to give us in being ambassadors of our faith. And I think it's really important that through our partnership with the museum, we look at ways of really inspiring our students to continue to visit, continue to explore all the incredible exhibits, artwork, artists that come into that space so that they can also feel a sense of who they are as well and hopefully inspire an artistic spirit that every student has. Uh, Meshka, how about you? I've had the opportunity to work with Idrib Pakistan and also with Idrib Afghanistan and Idrib Iran. So uh, all of them have been very eye-opening and, and uh, very inspiring, just seeing these students, how their thirst for knowledge and, 
uh, willing to come to these classrooms where there may be no light, no heat or no cold in various seasons um, was just so inspiring for me. In my trip to Afghanistan, uh, I was able to uh, go to various classrooms in different parts of um, Kabul and also uh, Mazari Sharif. Um, it was amazing to see this stu these students who did not necessarily have a book or even they had photocopies of these books who had been used over and over again. And it was it was really hard to see um, to be able to even read from these books. But but they were so uh, they would look at these books and read these books with so much interest. Um, and I was so inspired and I felt like, um, you know, we need so many more teachers to be able to um, to share their knowledge, to, to be able to go there and guide them. Um, there were thousands and thousands of students and um, compared to Canada, for example. And uh, I feel like um, it's time that we were able to share our knowledge and, and resources with uh, with our Jamaat around the world. Thank you, Mejgan. That's wonderful. You know, it's been over 10 years that uh, four of us have been teaching. Actually, I think this is our 12th year of, uh, of practice uh, that we and others from our cohort have been teaching. And I don't know about you, but I, I sometimes get questions from even family members or those around me who say, you're still teaching, you're still practicing, you know, why? Why are you, why are you still doing this? And, you know, for myself, you know, I became a teacher because I wanted to make an impact with it for the youth in my local Jamaat. I'm just grateful to see that I'm able to do that, not just for my local Jamaat, not just for the Canadian Jamaat, but that we can have an impact really worldwide. And when we see that, you know, this tremendous impact we can have, it just really gives me the energy to continue here. And, you know, one more thing is really, we now have students, or I you know I have students of my own that I taught way back when, who are now applying to be uh, teachers in the program. And that's just such an amazing feeling. So I wanted to ask you, you know, why, uh, why, what keeps you here? What keeps you, you know, the, the passion and the drive going? So, um, um, Fayaz, can you tell us why you're uh, still teaching? Yeah, so I want to answer this question by relating it to a piece of literature, um, a Muslim piece of literature. And uh, it's a fable, and the fable is titled uh, The Darvesh uh, and the Confectioner. Darvesh uh, as a Sufi member uh, of a tariqa. So the story goes like this. Uh, once a Darvesh was traveling through the market and he was handed a cup of honey. And as soon as he grabbed the cup of honey in his hand, a bunch of bees just stormed and went inside the cup. Some were just, uh, you know, on the edges of the cup, while other um, bees were inside, submerged into the honey. And so the moral of the story goes like this, that the honey represents this material world and those bees that are submerged inside the honey um, are too attached to the world, while those on the edge um, are good because they're not too attached to the world. But I take a different meaning from this story. I, I kind of relate it to our work. Um, for me, the honey represents, uh, you know, all the evidence uh, that I see around me of student learning. When a student is transforming and, and learning and applying what they're learning to their own life and to the world in which um, you know, they exist. Uh, and so uh, uh, the honey is also produced by a lot of labor, you know, a lot of work that goes into creating um, really good learning experiences. Um, and a lot of that labor is, is invisible. So I think um, you know, I've tasted the honey and so this is what keeps me here. That's wonderful. Thank you, Fayez. Thank you for the story. And I recognize the one from one of our uh, modules. Um, Fatima, how about you? Yeah, you know, uh, any educator or any teacher who starts the year off in September, everybody will say that the students are always different. Year after year, we get new students with new ideas and new interests and creativity. And that makes this role of being an educator unique and always different. So I think it's, you know, this idea that as we engage with new students, we are learning from them. 
I've been on a evolving journey of faith and understanding, and it's inspired by the students. They have brought to our classroom experience questions that sometimes I've never thought about. And so because of that experience, I want more. I want to learn with them. I want them to leave the classroom space feeling confident and a sense of belonging within this community. And so it goes beyond education for me. It goes to a place of belonging and a sense of pride within our community. I want each student to feel like the space that we have created is their space and that they can come and ask those questions. I think having been on this journey for so long, I have not, I've learned about myself and I've learned that what we are doing is a part of a vision that Hazri Mam has for all Marines. We are here to learn and understand about Allah's creation and use our education, not just for ourselves, but for the benefit of our Jamaat and the benefit of our community. And I want each student to have a piece of that and take it with them along their journey in education and hopefully then inspire others. Thank you, Fatima. I continue your response, you know, the web of connections between, you know, ourselves, our students, the Jamaat, you know, curriculum in the world. So that's, that's beautiful. Uh, Mejgan, um, what, you know, what drives you? What keeps you in the, in the practice? So very similar to what Fatima said, I totally agree with her. My students first and foremost. Um, I see teaching very, in some ways, very similar to parenthood. Um, you know, raising a child is so hard and sleepless nights and working so hard. And then one moment you embrace that child and you hear their first word and it's all worth it and you feel very fulfilled and happy. I think very similarly uh, in my teaching career, um, it's, you know, it has all the ups and downs. And then in classroom, um, you have one moment where a student makes a connection and they, they articulate um, something about who they are and you just feel so happy and fulfilled. And I think that makes it all worth it. Um, and I think number two, uh, why I'm here is also because I feel very close to the work of the Imam when I'm in, you know, when I'm teaching. Um, I feel that I just serving the Jamaat and serving the Imam is giving me a sense of fulfillment and happiness. Last but not least, um, being a mother of two boys, um, I really uh, like to uh, see my kids grow up uh, being able to talk about their faith confidently. Thank you, Mejgan. You know, that's that's a world I think we all hope for, for all of the kids and all of our Jamaat around us. And, you know, I tell my students that, um, you know, each one of us has an ability uh, to do, you know, to paint an artistic work. You might have different abilities, but I would say that, you know, that vision you painted for us is is quite masterful. And it gives me, you know, goosebumps, which you can't see the fact that, you know, a little, little short on hair on the top here, but I promise you they're there. And, you know, I want to thank each one of you, um, Fatima, Mejgan, Fayaz, thank you for taking the time for sharing your passion, your experiences with all of us. And, you know, on October 5th is World Teacher Day. Uh, and we'd like to share, you know, a shout out to all the teachers of all levels out there. So pre-primary, primary, secondary, post-secondary, you know, those, uh, the parents now that are acting as teachers in these, you know, difficult times. And all of you, thank you for the love, the creativity, the knowledge, the passion that you share with all the students, all the kids, all of us in helping us and helping them in, our, in their development and their growth. You know, for myself, you know, my grandfather was a teacher in East Africa, our principal. My mom was part of the first group of teachers in uh, the primary system. And I guess I shouldn't have uh, been surprised that I ended up following in their footsteps. And each one of us has, you know, that, that journey that brought us here. So merci beaucoup à tous les professeurs. Tashakur. Thank you all. And have a good uh, evening. I hope you enjoyed this segment of today's program. Truthfully, I can say that it is inspiring to work with these individuals whom I call my friends, my colleagues, and my mentors. And between you and me, I have some great stories to tell you about them from our time in London, 
But right now, we don't have time for that, so message me later. What we are going to move to is our long-awaited Kahoot quiz. What we did is we asked our step teachers from across the country to look at their favorite passages of the curriculum and submit questions so that you could test your own knowledge. Sounds good? All right, allons-y, here we go. Welcome everyone to today's edition of the Kahoot Quiz. We're about to start, so get ready. All right, so here's question number one. Yeah, Lima Das. This question is from the Muslim Devotional and Ethical Literature module of the IIS Secondary Curriculum. If a person has a good idea about you, make his idea be true. This quote is from which piece of Muslim literature? Option number one, Najal Balaga, Peak of Eloquence. Two, the Sira, Biography of the Prophet. Three, Conference of the Birds. Or four, the Kalamimola. An important work attributed to Hazrat Imam Ali is the Naj al Balaga, or Peak of Eloquence. It illustrates his thinking on matters of faith and ethics, his sense of justice, and his emphasis on knowledge, and it can be found in the Muslim Devotional and Ethical Literature module. All right, question numéro deux, question number two. This question is from the Quran and its Interpretations module. The Quran has been interpreted in a diversity of ways. What are two main approaches to interpretation which exist in Islamic tradition? Is it one, tafsir and tawhid? Two, tanzil and tafsir? Three, tawil and tawhid? Or four, tawil and tafsir? Well, there you go. As you can see, the correct answer is four, Tawil and Tafsir. Over time, there developed many interpretations of the Quran, depending on the beliefs of different communities. A very common approach to interpretation was the Tafsir, which means explanation, and the other was Tawil, or allegorical interpretation. Okay, and this can be found in the Quran Volume 1 module. Okay, so question number three. This question is from Encounters in Muslim History module. Chess, a game of mind and soul, underwent many adaptations as it traveled. Where do you think it was originally invented? Here's option number one. In China. Option number two. Persia. Option number three. India. Or option number four. Europe. Okay, so you now know that chess was invented in India, but did you know that it was originally called Katuranga? It came from India and then with the exchanges across trade routes, it spread eventually to Persia, later Europe, and as we know, pretty much everywhere else in the world. And this little fact comes from our Encounters module, Volume 1. Okay, so ready for question number 4? This question is from the Faith and Practice in Islamic Traditions module. For faith communities, rituals form an important part of their religious practice. What purpose do rituals serve for faith communities? Rituals can be personally transformative. Rituals can strengthen communal identity. Three, rituals connect us to the divine. Or four, all of the above. In religious traditions, rituals enable us to deepen our relationship with the divine, reinforce our individual commitments while creating a sense of unity and identity within the community. And this little fact comes to us from the Faith and Practice module, volume 2, right around page 16 to 20. Number 5. This question is from the Muslim Societies and Civilizations Curriculum, volume 2. 
The Fatimid Imam Caliphs in Cairo emphasized knowledge and education, and as a result, they commissioned the creation of institutions of learning. What is the name of one of the oldest universities located in Cairo? All right, and here are your options. Number one, Al-Azhar. Number two, Dar al-Ilm. Number three, Beit al-Hikmah. Or number four, Madrasa. Al-Azhar University was a mosque used for congregational prayers. Soon after its founding, it began to be used as a center of instruction, where lectures and study sessions were held. And many of us in the STEP program were fortunate enough to go see Al-Azhar uh, for all its glory uh, and the way it stands today, at least to imagine you know, what it might have been like in the past. And this bit of information comes to you from the Muslim Societies and Civilizations module, Volume 2, Right at the end in unit six, page two to four. Here is question number six. This question is from the Muslim Societies and Civilizations module. Al-Andalus, present day Spain and Portugal was under Muslim rule in the eighth century. It was a celebrated center of learning of culture and civilization. The notion of pluralism is rooted in the Andalusian practice of convivencia. What does convivencia mean? Is it one, coexistence, two, diversity, three, multiculturalism, or four, variety? Al-Andalus, which is present-day Spain and Portugal, was under Muslim rule in the 8th century and was a, a celebrated center of learning, culture, and civilization. Again, for anyone who has had a chance to visit or see images or just listen to the sounds and music of this region, it is truly diverse and inspirational and really epitomizes the sense of coexistence. And our Beit Ulum students, and of course, as we mentioned, the curriculum is for the whole Jamaat, so anyone can find this information in the Muslim Societies and Civilizations module, volume 2, right around page 113. Don't go getting that biryani or that kabuli palau or that mogul right now, because we only have four more questions to go, so let's see where you're at. This question is from the Faith and Practice in Islamic Traditions module. When we think about the act of practicing one's faith, it can be seen as a person's beliefs and intentions, a person's orientation and actions in the world, our prayers and practices. Number four, all of the above. What do you think? Put in your answers. Okay, let's see how you did. The answer is number four, all of the above. So, as you may know and may have heard on previous Friday Night Reflections and Kahoot Games, in Islam, faith encompasses both a way of being and our actions, as well as our prayers and practices. It's a sort of integrity that ties all parts of our lives together, which you might call din and dunya. And this is something that we explore in the Faith and Practice module, Volume 1, Unit 3. And really, it's an idea that comes out throughout the entire secondary curriculum. Number 8. Here's a question from the Qur'an in its interpretations module. Why is the Qur'anic message understood by Muslims as being universal? A. The Qur'an was only to guide the Prophet in his time. B. The Qur'an was only to guide people that lived in his time. C. The messages of the Qur'an cannot apply to Muslims in the 21st century. D. Muslims see God's guidance as holding true for all time and all places. The answer is D. Muslims see God's guidance as holding true for all times and all places. So the universality of the Quran, in addition to viewing the Quran as a historical message, Muslims see these both. 
They also see God's guidance as holding true for all times and all places, not only for the prophet or people who lived in his age. And this too is an idea that's explored right across the entire second year curriculum, and in particular in one of our newer modules called the Quran and its interpretations on page 128. Here's question number nine. This question is from Muslim devotional and ethical literature book. The Song of the Reed, a beautiful Sufi poem that discusses the theme of separation from the divine, was written by which famous Sufi poet? Do you think it is A. Jalal al-Din Rumi, B. Farid al-Din Attar, C. Muhammad Iqbal, or D. None of the above? Mulana Jalal al-Din Rumi is one of the most famous masters of mystical writings. In the Song of the Reed, the reed flute complains about being cut from the reed bed and longs for its origin. The reed symbolizes the human soul's separation from its divine origins. In fact, Rumi's work is recognized and appreciated and consumed worldwide. The Song of the Reed, amongst other places, features in the Muslim Devotional and Ethical Literature module on page 114. All right, ready or not, final question. Question number 10. Here we go. This question is from the Ethical Pathways to Human Development module. What role does the Quran al-Sharif suggest that human beings have on Earth? Is it A. Consumers? Is it B. Khalifas? Is it C. Preachers or D. Manufacturers? And yes, the answer is B. Khalifas. So according to the Holy Quran, an important perspective is that human beings are God's vicegerents or Khalifas on earth. We are appointed as deputies or leaders to look after Allah's creation. This special status places upon human beings the responsibility of looking after the world and all things in it. This comes to us from the Ethical Pathways to Human Development module, right near the end on page 114. All right, so I hope you did okay on our quiz, and I hope you're able to see the breadth and depth of our wonderful secondary curriculum books which truly are not only for our students, but for the entire Jamaat. So I hope that you'll find one and open it up. Take a look. There's some wonderful material for all of us to take advantage of. Well, now it's time to end our show and we leave you with some musical expressions from our wonderful artists. Thank you all for joining us today. It's truly been a pleasure to be your host and I really appreciate you spending this time with me. Please stay on for our musical pieces and come back next Friday. To everyone, Khuda Hafiz and stay well.